All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the next seminar. Um, so, so today I, I'm delighted to introduce um, Sebastian Merck, who is a almost graduated uh, PhD student um, from Macquarie. Um, so Sebastian is, yeah, has been doing his PhD here in, in Sydney at Macquarie, and he's uh, been working on um, very, various kind of quantum aspects of, uh, of black holes and, and black hole horizons, uh, which is a, a subject that I know is a particular interest to a few people here. So um, it should be a very interesting and, uh, and different seminar uh, to our usual one. So thanks, Sebastian, for agreeing to, to give us this, and um, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to, to share my research with you in today's seminar. Um, so as already mentioned, uh, the talk today is going to be mostly about black holes and how quantum aspects factor into that. And I've actually split the talk into two parts where only the second part is focused on my research. And in the first part, I want to motivate why I believe this particular area of research is interesting and deserves more attention. And of course, my, my hope with this two-part setup is that A, the, the information from the first part will be useful to you and it'll serve as a useful background um, because I think we have a lot of people in the audience that, that don't work with black holes on a daily basis. And B, that hopefully it'll allow you to better appreciate the context of what then follows in the second part of my talk. So this is what we are going to start off with. So what do black holes have to do with quantum gravity? And why are they suitable objects uh, of study if we want to learn about fundamental physics? And also, I would like to make this a fairly informal talk. So please feel free to interrupt me with questions and ask for clarifications in between slides. And of course, we'll also have plenty of time for questions at the end of the talk. Now, you will most likely be aware that in physics, we generally distinguish uh, between four fundamental interactions. And gravity will play an important role today, but for now, Let's just say that gravity is what dominates interactions at large distance scales. So gravity is what tells us uh, about the motions of planets and stars, and also about the formation uh, of the biggest structures in the universe, such as galaxies and galaxy clusters. Then we have electromagnetism, and it's probably fair to say uh, that this is the interaction that we're most familiar with, both from a theoretic perspective and from our everyday lives. Um, because every time you, you touch something, you're really feeling the, the electromagnetic interaction in a quite literal sense. Um, and, and one of the main differences between electromagnetism and gravity is that uh, you can shield electromagnetic charges uh, because there's two of them, plus or minus, or whatever names you, you want to assign to them. Uh, but gravity, at least for what we know today, is always attractive. And this also immediately explains why it dominates at large distances, even though it's the weakest of the four interactions, uh, because there's no way to, to neutralize it, at least for all we know today. And so these two interactions are actually the only two that we experience. Uh, but we do know that there are two more, thanks to the wonders of nuclear and particle physics, um, which are the weak and the strong interaction. So how do we know those exist? Well, we can measure the radioactive decay um, of particles. Uh, so this would be a, a typical example of the weak interaction. And a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks ago or so, you might have heard that uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN just started run three of proton-proton collisions. And this is in fact the, the prototypical example um, of the strong interaction. We have two theoretical frameworks that describe the four interactions. We have general relativity, which describes gravitational ones and quantum field theory, which describes all non-gravitational interactions. And these two okay. frameworks are really, yeah, was there a question in between? Oh, I think it was just somebody unmuted. I'll, I'll, I'll watch that. Oh, okay, no worries. <laughs> Um, yeah, so these two, um, just a, a side comment, these two frameworks are really um, the, the results of major breakthroughs that occurred around the, the 20th and uh, 19th century. Um, first, uh, the formulation of special relativity by Albert Einstein, which was then generalized uh, to general relativity. And similarly, the, the discovery of quantum mechanics, which was later generalized to, to quantum field theory. And of course, it would be nice to only have one theory that describes everything. Um, but at least for the moment, we're stuck with these two frameworks. And to understand why, at least for now, we're stuck with these two, uh, we have to take a closer look at how these theories actually work. So in quantum field theory, we have what is called the standard model of particle physics. And you're probably much more familiar with this than I am. So I won't spend too much time uh, explaining how this works. I'll just say that in, in this framework, we really consider fields to be the fundamental entities and then treat particles 
uh, as the excitations of the underlying fields. And uh, this is justified because in generic curved space times, the existence of particles is not observer independent. So there's no objective answer to the question uh, of whether or not a particle exists. It, it'll depend on, on who you ask. Uh, the only effect, for instance, is uh, a nice prediction that, that illustrates this. Nonetheless, we can, of course, uh, describe interactions between particles. And in QFT, this is done uh, with gauge bosons. So these are also sometimes called force carrier particles or force mediating particles. And those are the ones that we've already seen in the Feynman graphs on the first slide that I've showed. So for example, we have the photon. Um, this is how two electrons would interact uh, by exchanging photons. And similarly, we have the neutral Z boson and the charged W bosons for the weak interaction and the gluons for the strong interaction. Now, gravity is not included in the standard model. And in practice, this is actually not an issue, at least not immediately, because the masses of these particles are so small uh, that even in our, our most energetic uh, particle accelerator experiments, gravity is, is negligible. Um, but it is, of course, unsatisfactory from a logical view viewpoint that um, gravity is not included. And in fact, you might, might wonder, well, why can't we include gravity in this, in this framework? And there are very good, um, I mean, of course, there are proposals to, that include several different kinds of gravitons. Um, but it is, it is a bit uh, difficult to do this. And there are mathematical reasons for that that have to do with the non-remanalizability of the quantized gravitational field. And um, yeah, simplified, what this means is that when you calculate amplitude, you end up with infinities and there's no finite number of counter terms that you can subtract uh, to remove those infinities. But actually for, for the purposes of this talk, I don't want to dwell on the, on the mathematical details on why this is problematic or difficult, uh, but I do want to give you some physical intuition for why gravity uh, is maybe different fundamentally. And this intuition actually goes all the way back to Albert Einstein's intuition that uh, gravity is to be understood not so much as a force or an interaction, but rather we should look at it as a property of space-time itself. And what you see here on the left is actually an original sketch um, of Albert Einstein. And it's a prediction that he made based on this intuition. Um, so what Albert Einstein predicted is that star that's coming to us or traveling to us um, will be deflected by the curvature that's induced in the space-time geometry by the mass of our sun. And so the apparent position of the star that we observe will be different from the star's actual position. And importantly, the prediction for this angle of deflection differs from the prediction of Newtonian gravity by a factor of two. So this is an effect that you can make use of um, to see whether or not that theory is correct. And uh, it's an effect that you could measure even during Einstein time if you had a solar eclipse. And it's what ultimately actually led to the confirmation of the theory in 1919 which is only three years after Einstein published his, his famous paper. Okay, so the fundamental insight of Albert Einstein was that the geometry of space-time is nothing other than the manifestation of the gravitational field. And uh, you can express this mathematically in what we now call, or what we now refer to as the Einstein field equations. Um, so those were first published in this famous paper from 1916. And um, so these equations somehow relate the, the geometry of uh, space-time to a distribution of energy and matter. And just a little fun fact, the reason that we can treat energy and matter on the same footing here is actually Einstein's other famous formula, E equals mt squared. So this tells us that uh, energy and mass can be transformed into one another. And of course, this is just a, a special case of the more generic formula for the relativistic energy. But let's have a closer look at um, the Einstein equations. So on the left, we have uh, quantities that describe the geometry of space-time and on the right, a distribution of energy and matter, which is encoded in this quantity T mu nu. So this is called the energy momentum tensor. All of the quantities with the Greek indices are uh, rank two tensors. So you can write them as matrices if you wish. But for now, we can also just think of these uh, indices as placeholders for coordinates. For example, in Schwarzschild coordinates, those can take on four different um, parameters, T, R, theta, and phi. So this is the, the natural uh, four-dimensional generalization of spherically symmetric coordinates. And mathematically, um, this is a system of hyperbolic elliptic uh, differential equations. If we're in four space-time dimensions, then it has four independent variables. And we call the solutions metrics of space-time. So this is what um, this quantity G menu, which is called the metric tensor is. And this also means that if we have a solution, so if we know the metric tensor, then we can immediately derive the other quantities on the left-hand side, uh, which encode information about the curvature of space-time. 
So those are the Ritchie tensor and the Ritchie curvature scalars, and you can directly compute them from the metric. And actually, general relativity is special in the sense that uh, here you have at most second order derivatives in the metric. So for example, the Ricci tensor um, could depend on the metric and then first and second order derivatives. Now I should also mention uh, general relativity is an extremely well confirmed theory. For example, these are just some examples of the predictions that um, we have seen. Gravitational lensing is one of them. Uh, if you look really closely, you can also see this effect in the new JWST images that were just published this week, but it's actually the same effect um, that we've already learned about that was used to verify general relativity in 1919. So how does this work in terms of the uh, Einstein field equations? Um, well, those relate the geometry of space-time to a distribution of energy and matter. Uh, the sun is a massive object. Um, so due to the mass of the sun, the geometry of space-time will curve. And so light traveling to us will be deflected on its path. And so colloquially, uh, people often summarize the right-hand side and the left-hand side of the equations as saying, uh, matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. And uh, arguably one of the most spectacular predictions of general relativity, which is what we'll mainly talk about today are black holes. And especially in recent years, there have been spectacular advances in, in observational astronomy. Um, so for example, you may have seen this image from the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration, uh, which shows a light ring surrounding what is supposedly a black hole. Uh, and of course, you may have also seen this uh, newer image of Sagittarius A star, which is the compact object in our Milky Way galaxy. And you might also remember from two years ago, the Physics Nobel Prize uh, was awarded to Roger Penrose for his theoretical work on black holes, most notably the singularity theorems, and to Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Ghez for um, the observation of a supermassive compact object in the center of our galaxy. So this would be uh, this one here, the newer of the two EHD images. And of course, now almost six years ago, uh, LIGO and Berger announced the detection of gravitational waves that were emitted in a merger of two black holes. So this is almost exactly 100 years after uh, the famous 1916 Einstein paper. And many similar events, of course, have been detected since even um, black holes colliding with neutron stars. And there's a running tally actually on the LIGO website. So if you're interested, uh, you can keep up to date with the most recent events there. Uh, admittedly, these are of course, just some examples that I handpicked for today's talk. But if you're interested to find more, there's actually an entire uh, Wikipedia page dedicated just to tests of general relativity and uh, all of the different physical regimes that you can test it in. And if you look at the uh, references that are provided at the bottom of this page, you will find that there are many serious papers that are published uh, precisely on those different kinds of tests. So it's an extremely well-confirmed theory. Uh, so fact in, that you might even ask, well, do we really need quantum gravity? And uh, this is what I'll try to motivate in, in the next couple of slides. So just as a reminder of what quantum gravity is, it's the conjectured unification of quantum field theory and general relativity, or equivalently, you could say, uh, it's our attempt of finding a unification of these two theories. But it's important to keep in mind that uh, not all theories of quantum gravity are the same. There are many, many different approaches. And broadly speaking, you can categorize them uh, into two categories where the first one um, are theories that follow this, this quantum field theoretic perspective. Um, and this is also where at least initially non renormalizability is a problem. Um, and this group includes also uh, most famously various incarnations of string theory. And then there are background independent approaches that come from this uh, GR intuition of uh, gravity being manifested through space-time geometry. So these include uh, loop quantum gravity in both its covariant and canonical form. Then there's causal dynamical triangulations, Reggie calculus, uh, non commutative geometries, all of those types of theories. And it's important to point out that not only are these different approaches, but uh, these theories are also somewhat different uh, with respect to their uh, ambitions uh, or with, with respect to what they're trying to achieve. Uh, because string theory, for example, has a good chance to present uh, a truly unified framework, uh, at least of the perturbative aspects of all interactions in the sense that they will follow uh, from a common object, the string. Um, and this would also nicely explain the, the particle content that we have observed in, in the standard model. But this is fundamentally different for, uh, from what loop quantum gravity tries to achieve, for example, uh, because in loop quantum gravity, we, we try to unify things in a slightly different way. So here the idea is that uh, the interactions are unified in the sense that they must transform under a common gauge group. 
uh, which is the four-dimensional different morphism group, uh, which by the way is almost completely broken in these perturbative approaches like string theory. So you could say that uh, LQG is maybe a bit more modest in what it's trying to achieve. Um, and it cannot be a theory of everything like string theory could be, but on the other hand, it also doesn't impose extra structures like uh, extra dimensions or supersymmetric particles that we haven't observed so far. But this was really just supposed to be a side comment. Uh, I can really recommend those two books, uh, Carlo Velli and Francesco Vidotto, Covariant Loop Quantum Gravity, and Thomas Thiemann with Modern Canonical Quantum General Relativity, uh, if you want to get a good overview of the landscape of quantum gravity, even just reading the, the introductions of these two books uh, paints a really nice picture. But now back to the, the problem of quantum gravity, or what actually is the problem of unifying these two frameworks? Well, the problem is that we know uh, on a fundamental level, they are not compatible. And because we know this, we also know that general relativity cannot be the correct description of, of space and time on a fundamental level. There's also other indications, um, for example, GR predicts non-space like singularities, uh, but I won't go into those today. So the question is, well, how do we actually know those are incompatible? And the short answer is many reasons to give one example. Uh, general relativity is a classical theory and it's completely deterministic, but quantum field theory is not, it's a quantum theory, so it's probabilistic. Um, so this means in general relativity, if you have sufficient information about the initial state of a system, um, then you can predict exactly what's going to happen with 100% certainty. Excuse me, but in, um, in Q of T, you can never do that. You can only ever predict uh, probabilistic, uh, you can only ever predict probabilities for different outcomes to occur, even if you have all available information about the initial state of a system. And well, why is this problematic? Uh, we can look at a really simple thought experiment, which is the double slit. Uh, so most of you will have seen this at, at some point in your careers. Uh, this is where we send a quantum particle to uh, through two narrow slits. And it turns out that uh, the quantum particle will actually enter into a superposition of two different trajectories. And we know that this is true because we can detect the interference pattern of the detector. Classically, what you would expect is that you just have two uh, narrow intensity peaks that line up with the two slits. But this is not what you, what you observe uh, unless you have information on which way the particle took. If you don't have that information, then uh, you will find that this particle enters a, a superposition of these two trajectories. And now this is a bit problematic because remember that general relativity tells us that energy and matter uh, curve the geometry of spacetime. So the geometry of spacetime will differ slightly depending on which of the two trajectories the particle takes. Um, so the, the big question here is, well, what, what happens to the gravitational field when the particle enters the superposition? And naively you might say, well, okay, obviously the quantum gravitational field and uh, the gravitational field will also have to enter some, some sort of superposition. And that would be nice, but keep in mind that uh, GR is classical, so superpositions are not allowed in this theory. So you can already tell from this very simple thought experiment uh, that when it comes to the foundation of physics, we're in a bit of trouble. And I should also point out, this is just one example. Uh, you can actually cook up infinitely many of these uh, paradoxical or seemingly paradoxical examples just by combining features of, of quantum field theory and GR that are incompatible. Now, what's nice is that from this very simple thought experiment, uh, we can actually also understand why it's so difficult to get observational evidence for quantum gravitational effects. And it's because currently available experiments, they fall into two categories, either they measure quantum effects, so they use very uh, small and light objects, or they measure gravitational effects, which means they use very big and heavy objects. Um, but to see true quantum gravitational effects, you would really need to demonstrate that uh, macroscopic the large objects have distinct quantum properties. And of course, this is very hard to come by. And this is also where black holes come in because black holes uh, have a very strong gravitational influence. And there's some good reason to believe that, that quantum aspects influence their dynamic evolution, as we will see in the second part of the talk. <clears throat> and I should also mention, so this was a very simplified experiment, um, but people are actually working on amplifying these quantum gravitational effects in tabletop experiments. One of these groups is uh, Maleto and Vidral. So there's a comment in Nature and also um, a paper in PRL that was published. And there's another paper in PRL um, by Sugato Bos and collaborators, which is also very interesting. And then there are two papers by Marius Cristodolo and Carlo Rovelli um, with proposals on how you could demonstrate 
that there uh, may or may not be quantum superpositions of space-time geometries or that uh, time may be discrete. And this actually concludes the, the first part of my talk, uh, which means we're now moving on to the second talk uh, part where I'll mostly talk about work that I've done during my PhD. So this is uh, work that concerns the study of black holes and semi-classical and modified theories of gravity. And I'll get into what these are very shortly. Uh, but before I do that, I want to quickly mention my collaborators because most of what I'm showing you today are the results of collaborative works. So we have Robert Mann from the University of Waterloo and the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Canada. Valentina Pacetti, uh, who some of you may know because she used to be a postdoc at Macquarie University in Sydney uh, when I started my PhD, but is now at RMIT University in Melbourne. And then at Macquarie University, we have my PhD advisor, Daniel Turner, and Pravin Dahal, who's also a PhD student. And I should also mention that uh, Robert Mann, Daniel Turner, and I recently published a big review on exactly this topic. Uh, so black holes and semi-classical modified gravity theories. So you can find much more comprehensive and details version, uh, detailed versions of everything that I'm showing you today, including mathematical derivations, if you're into that in this review. And of course, it's also available on the archive, I should mention. Okay, so now we've arrived at the question of, well, what are semi-classical and modified theories of gravity? And what is their purpose? Uh, in the first part of the talk, we've sort of seen that fundamental problems seem to arise due to the fact that general relativity is classical, whereas quantum field theory is not classical, it's a quantum theory. Uh, but it turns out you actually can take quantum effects into account even for gravitational dynamics, at least to some degree. And um, the, the two theories that we're talking about today that do that are semi-classical and modified theories of gravity. So how does it work? Well, in semi-classical gravity, what we do is that rather than working with the standard energy momentum tensor of classical GR, we consider the expectation value of the renormalized energy momentum tensor in some quantum state psi. And this allows you to effectively take into account quantum effects uh, of energy and matter. So for the right-hand side of the Einstein equations. But keep in mind that here, the left-hand side is still completely classical. And in fact, we don't know how to make the left-hand side quantum as well, because if we did, well, then we would already have a fully functional developed theory of quantum gravity. Um, but at the moment we don't. However, there, there is something that you can do, um, which is you can add a term to the left-hand side and then say that, well, this term on the left-hand side should account for deviations that would arise from having a truly quantum gravitational space-time geometry. Uh, so mathematically speaking, this is the term that arises from higher order curvature corrections in the gravitational Lagrangian density. So keep in mind the, the way we arrive at our field equations is um, from the action and the action is just the integration over the Lagrangian density plus some appropriately chosen boundary terms. And in general relativity, we have the Einstein-Hilbert action, which is strictly linear in the Ricci scalar. And the Einstein-Hilbert action is special in the sense that it's actually the most general gravitational action that you can construct from rank two tensors uh, with at most second order derivatives in the metric, while of course maintaining diffeomorphism invariance. But here, this is no longer the case. We're no longer strictly linear in the Ricci scalar. Uh, we have higher order curvature corrections. And actually, even if you just add this R square term, uh, so this would be a, a specific type of F of R theory, the Sharabinsky model, uh, even then you already have fourth order derivatives in your field equations. Um, okay, so let, let's see what these theories are good for, starting with semi-classical gravity. And one of the most impressive achievements of this uh, theory is actually the prediction that black holes evaporate. And Stephen Hawking was one of the first, if not the first, uh, to really take the semi-classical idea seriously and apply it to the physics of black holes. And what he found was that if you take these quantum effects into account, then black holes will emit thermal radiation, just like an ordinary black body. And due to this radiation, black holes will slowly evaporate. And this prediction actually gave rise to a now a very famous dilemma, uh, which you will probably have seen in the popular media at some point, um, because at least in, in my feed, it seems to be popping up every two weeks or so. And of course, I'm talking about the infamous information loss paradox. So just as a quick reminder of how, how this works, uh, imagine that you have a bunch of things that are falling into a black hole. So maybe your favorite uh, general relativity box. And then when the black hole evaporates, uh, at the end of this process, all that you have left is thermal radiation. 
But keep in mind, thermal radiation means that this is uncorrelated information and it cannot contain any information other than the mass and the temperature of the black hole. Now, why is this a problem? It's a problem because from the mass and the temperature of the black hole alone, you cannot reconstruct what fell into the black hole. So when the black hole evaporates completely, all that you're left with is thermal radiation. So the question is, um, well, where did the information go? And this is a, a problem because the quantum theory is unitary. Uh, so this tells us that information should really be preserved. I've also already mentioned that we've seen some observational evidence for black holes, but I wasn't very precise here uh, because notice that there's actually an extra adjective here. So these are what we commonly call astrophysical black hole candidates or astrophysical black holes for short. And I've also previously mentioned the uh, 2020 Nobel Prize in Physics. And now I wanted to have a close look at the two descriptions um, that were published by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences uh, for why uh, justifying why these, these prizes were awarded to Penrose, Gensel and Gess. And on the left, uh, you can see they have no issues calling it a black hole when it comes to the theoretical work of Roger Penrose. But then all of a sudden, when it comes to observational astronomy, it's no longer a black hole. It's a supermassive compact object. So that's a bit suspicious. Uh, and it brings us to the question, well, when is it actually appropriate um, to refer to an object as a black hole? And the distinction here is very important. Um, and it's important for the following reason. If, you, if these objects that we're seeing are really black holes, then we really have to come to grips with their physical character. And that also means coming to terms with the physical implications of their existence, which means strange causal structures and space time singularities. Um, since we're already uh, <laughs> involving Nobel laureates, I picked out a quote from uh, Kip Thorne's book in which he says, or in which he writes, it is difficult to believe that physical singularities are a fundamental and unavoidable feature of our universe. One is inclined to discard or modify that theory rather than accept the suggestion that the singularity actually occurs in nature. And two months ago, you might have seen um, the announcement from the new Event Horizon Telescope results because there was a press conference at the ESO headquarters on the 12th of May. And I've picked out a short video from that press conference. Um, so what you see in the video is the opening statement after all of the generic introductions, which is delivered by Dr. Sarah Isaun from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Now I have to quickly disconnect my headphones and then hopefully you will be able to hear the video uh, over my laptop speakers. Okay, let's see if this works. This is the first image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy, Sagittarius A star. For decades, we have known about a compact object that is at the heart of our galaxy that is 4 million times more massive than our sun. Today, right this moment, we have direct evidence that, that this object is a black hole. Yeah, sorry about that quick cut off. Um, let me try to reconnect my headphones. Okay. In case it didn't and it didn't work, uh, I also typed set the code below. Um, and so the, the claim here is uh, that not only is that object that we're seeing um, not just, it's not just any compact object, it actually is truly a black hole. And the second part of the claim is that uh, the event horizon telescope results uh, are direct evidence that this is truly a black hole. So this is really uh, a bold claim. And I will explain on the next few slides why that statement is factually incorrect. And to assess the validity of that statement, uh, we need to know what makes a black hole a black hole. And not just that in particular, we need to know what distinguishes a black hole from alternative descriptions of dark compact objects. For example, horizon as ultra compact objects. Now, depending on uh, what you do for a living, what field of research you're, you're working in, it may or may not come as a surprise that actually there is no unanimously agreed upon definition of a black hole. So rather what happens in practice is that different researchers are interested in different aspects of black holes. And so they will work with a definition that's most suitable for their purposes. And usually that's a definition that, that highlights the features of the black hole that they're interested in. 
Having said that, despite the fact that there's no unanimously or universal definition that everyone uses, um, there is a consensus that, that black holes are objects that trap light. And this is something that you can express mathematically uh, using the idea of a closed trap surface, which was first pioneered by Roger Penrose. And um, those clap, uh, closed trapped space-time domains are bounded by horizons. And this brings us to uh, the, the notion of a black hole horizon. And the one that you're most likely familiar with is that of an event horizon, um, because the black holes that are predicted by general relativity uh, are black holes that are bounded by these event horizons. So these are, in, in technical speak or technical lingo, these are called mathematical black holes. Um, the reason is that this is a, a very convenient definition from a mathematical perspective, and you can derive many lovely theorems. Most of them are contained in the, the book by Hawking and Ellis, if you're interested. But, and this is a very important point, um, event horizons are not physically observable, not even in principle. And the reason is topologically speaking that the event horizon is a global definition of the boundary of a black hole, but as quasi local observers, we do not have access to global topological information. Uh, so we will never be able to determine the presence of event horizons. And Matt Visser actually wrote this quite nicely in his paper. He wrote that in order to make the statement that an event horizon exists, you would really have to know the entire history of the entire universe and therefore also infinitely far into its future evolution. So this tells us that event horizons are completely unsuitable for all practical purposes, such as observational astronomy. And there's a nice quote by Matt Visser uh, from this paper. If you haven't read that paper and you're interested in black holes, I really recommend it. It's one of my favorite papers. And uh, in this paper, he writes, it's perhaps a little disturbing to realize that the quite serious deficiencies and limitations exhibited by event horizons while well appreciated within the general relativity community, are largely not understood or appreciated in the wider physics community. And I should also mention Stephen Hawking towards the end of his career shied away from the, the concept of an event horizon. Um, so in one of his papers he wrote, the absence of an event horizon means that there are no black holes in the sense of regimes from which light can't escape infinity. There are however, apparent horizon, uh, horizons which persist for a period of time. And at the GR17 conference, he also said, uh, a true event horizon never forms, just an apparent horizon. So now, what exactly, um, we have a, a question here by Bruce, yeah? So, so this point that you've been discussing on the last couple of slides, I, I take it that's one of the stronger examples of this earlier argument that it's a kind of an it's kind of necessary that there's more than one definition of a black hole. That I mean you know, that, it, the, that, that it's not it's not perverse that there's more than one definition running, because this thing that you would think of as absolutely characteristic of a black hole theoretically is in fact not observable experimentally. In yes, strict that's sense. true. That's true. And in fact, um, so the paper I showed earlier by Eric Coriel with the many definitions of a black hole, there's actually one of the, the points that he makes that it's actually a good thing that we have different definitions of these objects, but you have to be aware of the differences. And also you have to even be more aware of the differences when you try to translate results from one area to another. Um, Absolutely. And event horizons, yeah. And so event horizons are the ones that um, strictly speaking are used to model astronomical observations because those are based on on the Schwarzschild care paradigm, but we know, and it has been known for a long time, that you can never observe them, not even in principle. Um, but there are different notions, and this is what will actually, uh, did that answer the, the question? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Okay, great. Um, now, having said that, so event horizons are, are not observable, but there are notions um, that are observable, and the apparent horizon is one of them. Um, so this is the one that um, was just mentioned in the, in the quote by Stephen Hawking. Um, However, I, I won't give you an exact mathematical definition because it's not quite, uh, it's not entirely trivial. It involves some concepts from differential geometry and topology, uh, most importantly, that of a trapped null surface. And what's written in this box here is not important for the talk. This is just to give you an example of how one could make this, uh, this definition precise. So this is from one of our papers where we've defined a physical black hole um, as a trapped region, so it's a space-time domain where both ingoing and outgoing future directed null geodesics that originate from a two-dimensional space-like surface with spherical topology have negative expansion. And then you can define uh, the apparent horizon as the evolving outer boundary of that trapped space-time domain. 
But as I said, this is a bit beyond the scope of, of today's talk and the details are not super relevant for understanding the gist of it. But again, I do want to provide you um, with some physical intuition. And the easiest example that I could come up with is a unit two sphere in three dimensions, which you can see on the right hand side here. And let's for now say that we consider this in, in flat space time. So Minkowski space time, actually Minkowski is already four dimensional. So let's for now say we're in three dimensions with no curvature. And in, in this space time, you can define uh, you can define radial null vectors, uh, inward pointing ones and outward pointing ones. And what you'll find is that inward pointing radial null vectors will converge. So they'll get closer and closer together until they meet at a single point. This will be the, the center of the sphere, if it's a regular sphere, um, which by definition it is here. And the outward pointing ones will, will diverge. So the further away you move, um, the larger the distance between the endpoints of those vectors will be. Now, Here's the, the definition that seems somewhat counterintuitive at first, which is that uh, a trapped surface is one where both inward pointing and outward pointing radial null vectors converge into a single point. And now you might say, well, how is this possible? Because how can a bundle of these outward pointing vectors uh, ever converge into a single point? And you are in fact absolutely right because in three flat space time dimensions, it's not possible, but it is very much possible in an evolving four dimensional curved space time. And uh, to give you an idea of how this works, I've uh, clipped this short illustration from a YouTube video by PBS Space Time. And what you see here is that what's actually happening is uh, that the, the trapped region sort of collapses onto itself. And if that happens quickly enough, then even outward pointing vectors um, that are right at the surface will converge into the singularity, which is illustrated by this red point in the middle. And then, um, the apparent horizon is simply the outermost of all trap surfaces for which this is true. So here the precise mathematical term uh, would be marginally outermost trap surface or MOTS. Uh, but again, in terms of physical intuition, you can just think of the apparent horizon uh, as the boundary that separates uh, the uh, outward moving light rays um, that are traveling outward and those that are outward pointed but traveling inwards. Now let's get Back to the question of, um, actually, let's quickly summarize what, we, what we've learned. Um, yeah, I think this is that side. Okay, good. I was jumping ahead a little bit. So we've learned that uh, the event horizon is a global notion of the boundary of a black hole. Uh, we can never be detected because we don't have access to global information. Even if I gave you a magical detector that could measure any physical quantity at any point in space time with arbitrary precision, okay, maybe limited by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but. Um, it, it still wouldn't allow you to determine the presence of an event horizon, simply because we're also limited by cosmological horizons and such. So we, we simply don't have access to the global uh, topological space time. And so these are not useful for, for anything that um, is involving astronomic observations or, or other practical purposes. But there are well-defined quasi-local notions. Um, one of them that we've learned is the apparent horizons, but I should also mention this is not the only one. There are similar related ones like trapping horizons, um, some types of geometric horizons. And quasi-local here just means that it is possible, at least in principle, to set up an experiment in a finite size region of space-time and within a finite time interval that will answer the question of uh, does this apparent horizon exist? So it's a local notion, quasi-local notion of the boundary of a black hole. To the best of my knowledge, so far we have no evidence um, that these exist or have not seen them anywhere. And you might ask, well, how could one possibly detect them? And um, there are a couple of, of promising avenues. So one of them is quasi-normal modes because if uh, a stable ultra compact object is perturbed, then it's expected that the frequency and damping time of the oscillations on return to its equilibrium state uh, will differ for different models of, of ultra compact objects. Um, the different models here being horizonless ultra compact objects and uh, genuine physical black holes with some quasi-local notion of a horizon. There are also things like gravitational wave echoes. So um, differences in the quasi-normal mode spectrum could also manifest themselves in the behavior of late time emissions of gravitational waves that result from the perturbation. And then um, there are other proposals, um, for example, that the relation between the luminosity of matter accreting into the UCO uh, will be, uh, and its accretion rate will depend on the presence or absence of a horizon. But these are just some examples that I think are uh, among the most promising ones. And now you might ask, well, is it surprising that we have not seen evidence for, for any such horizon so far? 
And the answer is, well, not really. And the reason is that astronomical observations use the Schwarzschild care paradigm um, uh, in their modeling process. And you can come up with horizonless configurations that mimic these solutions so closely that you would really need almost Planck scale precision uh, in order to be able to rule those objects out. So it's not surprising uh, that we so far have not seen uh, any indications for these horizons. A great paper for this is um, by Bob Holdem and Jingren, not quite a black hole. Um, and I've, I've highlighted the, the relevant parts from the abstract here. So going back to information loss, how does that uh, relate to the information loss problem? It's actually been shown also by Matt Vista that you don't need a horizon to emit Hawking radiation. You don't need an event horizon. In fact, you don't even need an apparent horizon and you can still emit thermal radiation. Uh, however, having a horizon is absolutely necessary for this paradox because without the horizon, you cannot trap information. And in fact, if you want to formulate the informationless paradox, then you don't just need any horizon, you need an event horizon because only the event horizon will give you an observer independent notion uh, of tracing out of the black hole degrees of freedom. Um, if it's an apparent horizon because it's quasi local, it's not observer independent. So to formulate this paradox, you really need an event horizon. However, there are some scenarios in, in spherical symmetry where the existence of an event horizon would imply the existence of an apparent horizon. Um, so if we detect an apparent horizon, then maybe this is a real problem. But ultimately the, the question of whether or not this is a real problem um, depends on what is the true nature of these objects that we're seeing. And so the, the two models that are currently being used are horizon with ultra compact objects or genuine physical black holes with some well-defined quasi-local notion uh, of a horizon. And of course, there are many subcategories that can be regular or not, they can have a singularity or not, and so on and so forth. And to answer the question of which model is correct and describes what we observe um, really requires a, a detailed analysis of the near horizon geometry. And uh, this detailed classification of the near horizon geometry uh, was one of the main objectives of my PhD. And I've listed some, some references here, but I'll summarize the main results in the next few slides. Now, what you see on the right-hand side here is the standard carter penrose diagram of an evaporating black hole. And what you see here are um, indicated by these arrows are space-time regions that correspond to mathematical black holes. So these are the ones that are bounded by an event horizon and physical black holes. These are the ones bounded by an apparent horizon. And in fact, um, what's indicated here in red and blue, uh, the red one is the inner component of the apparent horizon. The blue part is the outer component uh, of the apparent horizon. And unfortunately, my mouse just froze. Oh, there we go. Now you will also see from this diagram that part of the physical black hole is located outside of the event horizon. And in fact, this shaded blue region is what we call the quantum ergosphere. And it's actually possible to escape the physical black hole from this quantum ergosphere, because if you look at the uh, dashed gray lines here, so those are outgoing radial null geodesics, you can actually escape from this region and end up at future null infinity. Um, then a few more things to point out here, this uh, sigma TS is an equal time hypersurface. Uh, so this is null where it intersects with the apparent horizon in space like everywhere else. So if um, you travel on an equal time surface through the trapped region, it'll be time-like while you're in the trapped region and space like everywhere else. Um, this green line is just a distant observer, Bob. And one more fact that is somewhat underappreciated is that uh, during evaporation, we know that this outer apparent horizon is a time-like surface. Um, because even at the GR23 conference last week, there were some talks uh, in which this was not assumed to be the case in which this was taken to be space-like, but we actually know it has to be a time-like surface during evaporation. Now, I should also mention all of what I just told you about this diagram uh, is an immediate consequence of two implicit assumptions that people make in semi-classical gravity. And the first of these is regularity. Uh, regularity just means that curvature scalars, for example, the trace and the square of the energy momentum tensor should be finite at apparent horizons. And this again is a direct consequence of the cosmic censorship conjecture. The second assumption is that horizons form in finite time according to distant observers. And um, I should also point out um, that uh, for, for some models of regular black holes, this is not uh, an assumption, it's actually an immediate consequence that follows directly from the formation and disappearance of the trapped region. So this is also an aspect that is somewhat underappreciated. And another one that has been known for quite some time 
but is also often overlooked in contemporary literature is that we know that the formation of a horizon in finite time of a distant observer uh, requires a violation of the null energy condition. So this condition means that if you contract the energy momentum tensor um, with null vectors, uh, the result that you get is negative. And this is somewhat undesirable physically because that means you need forms of well, quote unquote matter that have negative energy density. So this has to be something that behaves unlike anything we have observed so far. Okay, so how do we actually um, derive those results? And I'm going to uh, restrict myself to spherical symmetry for the purposes of this talk. And what you see here is the most generic way uh, to write the line element specifying a spherically symmetric geometry. You could equally well specify it by giving the, the metric tensor and its components. Uh, usually people just write the line element because it's more compact. And um, you see that there are two functions here that pop up, H and F. And H is essentially just an integrating factor that tells you how you transform between different coordinates. So for example, between TR and BR coordinates um, or Schwarzschild and, and advanced null coordinates, if you like. And this function F here is defined as one minus C over R, um, where C or, or more precisely C half is the Misner sharp mass. So this is a, a notion of gravitational energy that's contained within a sphere of radius R and it's a very convenient definition that people like to use with because by, very, by its very definition, it's invariant. Um, so it's easily translatable across different coordinate systems. Now in practice, we actually don't work with energy momentum tensor components, but rather uh, we work with, with what we call effective energy momentum tensor components. So these are just energy momentum tensor components rescaled by some factors of e to the power of minus h. And this is much more convenient but to see it, you have to look at the Einstein equations. So in spherical symmetry, we have three of them for the TT component, uh, which is the first one, the RR component is the last one here, and the TR component. Uh, if you're wondering why we have one for the TR component, even though uh, the components are zero, yes, it's true, they're zero for the metric tensor, but keep in mind that on the left-hand side, uh, we also have the Ricci tensor, and the Ricci tensor TR components are not zero, even in spherical symmetry. So we have three uh, differential equations for the two metric functions, C and H. And what this redefinition of the energy momentum tensor components does is you can see that now uh, C and H simultaneously appear only in this TR equation. So what this allows you to do is you can solve the first and the third equation independently from each other. And then the TR equation, the second one, uh, will give you a consistency condition that actually governs the dynamics of your black hole because this is the time derivative of the Misner sharp mass. So this will tell you if your black hole accretes or evaporates. Now there's one last comment, uh, one last thing that I need to mention here, which is that in spherical symmetry, there are actually only two self-consistent dynamic solutions. And those can be characterized according to the scaling behavior of their effective energy momentum tensor uh, close to the horizon. And what you'll find is that as you approach the horizon, uh, these components will scale as this function F to some power of K, but there are only two values of K that are consistent, namely K0 and K1. So we refer to those as K0 and K1 solutions. And this is what it looks like uh, when you write down the metric functions for these solutions explicitly. I should mention, this is not a, a typo here. There really only is one unique K1 solution that is self-consistent, but for K0, there's multiple different ones. And um, this unique K1 solution is actually the one uh, that describes black holes at the instant of their formation. And then immediately after the formation, the behavior will change uh, to that of a K0 solution. And the black hole will remain as a K0 solution for the rest of its lifetime. Now, both of those solutions violate the null energy condition near the outer horizon. So this is not a surprise. This is actually uh, mandatory uh, to have a horizon form in finite time of a distant observer. And I should also mention that the transition uh, between these solutions is continuous. And uh, what makes this smooth transition possible is the fact that for the K1 solution, the null energy condition is violated only outside of the apparent horizon. Uh, but for the K0 solution, it's actually also violated up to some R smaller than the horizon radius RG. And this, this makes this uh, continuous transition possible. Now I want to briefly summarize what we've found, what our results are in semi-cluster gravity. So we know the for, uh, formation of horizon finite time for just an observer requires a violation of the null energy condition. 
Uh, like I said, this has been known for, for quite some time, since at least 1973. Uh, in this paper, we've rederived that result in a different way by not making any assumptions uh, about the asymptotic structure of space-time, uh, which Hawking and Ellis have made. But on the other hand here, we explicitly work in spherical symmetry, whereas uh, Hawking and Ellis do not. So in a sense, those two results really nicely uh, complement each other. And we also know that the outer apparent horizon is time-like during evaporation. Then something else that we found is that in spherical symmetry, only two classes of dynamic solutions are self-consistent and uh, the formation of black holes follows a unique scenario that involves both of these solutions. Then we've also looked at um, the necessary energy and time scales that would be required for horizon formation in semi-classical gravity. So this is assuming that you have some exotic negative energy density matter that can produce the horizon. Um, and we found that these time scales and energy scales do not match uh, with what has been observed. So for example, for a solar mass black hole, we found that the horizon formation time would be something like 10 to the power of 64 years. And to put that into perspective, this is roughly four and a half times uh, of the age of our entire universe. And this time increases for heavier black holes. So if you look at M87 or Sagittarius A star, uh, this would be much longer. So even if horizons can form in principle, assuming that you, you have violated the NEC somehow, um, the, the objects that we're currently seeing cannot correspond uh, to, to real horizon objects if you believe in semi-classical gravity. And we also found that uh, the outer apparent horizon is a weakly singular surface in the precise technical sense. And this manifests itself in, in mild firewalls. And one of the results of these firewalls is uh, also that we know if semi-classical gravity is valid, then actually these objects can no longer accrete matter uh, after the horizon has formed. And this is also in, in contradiction with experiments because we know from the event horizon telescope observations uh, that both M87 and Sagittarius A star accrete matter. So where does that leave us with respect to these two possible models? Um, well, the, the only conclusion that you can draw here really is that it doesn't make sense to uh, simultaneously believe in semi-classical gravity and identify these objects uh, as genuine physical black holes. Because first of all, you need exotic uh, matter that has like negative energy density or, or something similar to that. Uh, but even then the energy and time scales and um, the fact that these objects seem to accrete don't match with the predictions of semi-classical gravity. Now that doesn't mean that these objects do not exist. It just means that in addition to violating the NEC, uh, we need new physics beyond semi-classical gravity to, to have these objects. And of course, one of the ways to account for new physics is uh, with modified gravity theories. And this is what I'll discuss in the last part of my talk, but this also means that now is a, a good time to stop and look back on what we've learned from the last few slides. Um, so we've seen there are two models that uh, I used to describe uh, astrophysical black hole candidates, genuine physical black holes with some horizon and horizonless ultra compact objects. And all currently available data is compatible with, with both of these models. Uh, we've also seen that the present day experiments do not have um, enough precision or they're not, the precision that we currently have available does not suffice to infer the existence of any well-defined quasi-local motion of a horizon. Um, we've also learned that unlike the formation of these horizons ultra compact objects, the formation of genuine physical black holes with some sort of horizon uh, requires exotic new physics. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means at least a violation of the null energy condition so matter that, that really behaves unlike anything we have observed before. And even then uh, we run into contradictions of, uh, with semi-classical gravity, as we've seen, even if we have this NEC violation. And uh, lastly, uh, we've also learned that many problems actually rely on the existence of uh, a horizon that separates the space-time into accessible and inaccessible regions. And in fact, in many of these cases, you, you need not just any horizon, uh, but you need an event horizon. Now, there are two, uh, a couple more comments I want to make here. Um, yes, Bruce, yeah. So I'm afraid I missed some, some really crucial point because you were, you were making many of your arguments with, uh, with a Penrose diagram sitting in the in the middle of the slide and so I was thinking in terms of general rel but then you've established that you can't form a horizon in finite time 
um, and making some sort of quantum mechanical argument and I missed the join. So. <laughs> yeah, um, it's actually quite easy. So in general relativity, just this causal contradiction exists where the distant observer Bob can see the black hole evaporate even though he never sees the horizon form. And actually it's not really a causal contradiction because we know through Matt paper that you don't need a horizon to um, thermally evaporate. Um, but it turns out in semi-classical gravity, you can form a horizon in final time of a distant observer, but then you need to violate the null energy condition if you want us to be in, in final time of a distant okay, observer. So the argument was specifically about black hole evaporation, not about black hole. Uh, no, this is just about horizon formation. So I'll this have is to come back to this later. Keep, keep going. Yeah. There's something I've missed. Yeah. The, so the diagram specifically showed evaporating black holes, but yeah. the argument about horizon formation is more generic. Right. Um, please, please keep going, but I might yeah. come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah no worries. Um, so here, the, the things that I wanted to point out is um, the, the first two arguments here alone actually suffice to refute any claim that the, the presently available results constitute direct evidence for the existence of black holes, or that they, they show that the objects that we observe are black holes. Um, so these two, the first two arguments are, are enough to refute any of those claims. Um, but what's also interesting here is um, that, I, that I want to comment on is in uh, generally in science, uh, if we have multiple models that can explain observations, then um, there's something called the principle of parsimony or you might know it by other names, Occam's razor or whatever. Um, and this tells us that uh, typically if we have multiple models, then we should choose the, the simpler or the simplest of these models. And here, given that uh, we really need new exotic matter to form the horizon, but we don't need it for horizons ultra convict objects, you could really make a compelling case that uh, the horizon as UCO model is simpler compared to the, the genuine physical black hole model. Um, and, and therefore should be preferred. So this is one, one comment I wanted to make. The other one is that this act of insisting new physics beyond what has been observed should really not be taken lightly. Um, and typically it's actually reserved as a means to overcome or at least to alleviate unresolved issues. Uh, for example, to, to reconcile discrepancies of observations or resolve mathematical inconsistencies. For example, earlier I talked about candidate theories of quantum gravity. And those ones are speculative and involve new physics, but they're usually expected to cure uh, other problems like the non-space-like singularities predicted by GR. Um, however, here, if you insist on identifying these objects with physical black holes, so if you're insisting on new physics, you're actually doing ex exactly the opposite um, because instead of resolving outstanding issues, um, you need new physics to produce the horizon, but then the presence of a horizon doesn't solve your problems. It actually creates new inconsistencies that don't exist with this horizon as UCO model. And uh, a nice quote that I, I thought was quite fitting here is by David Hume, uh, which says, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which endeavors, it, the fact which it endeavors to establish. Um, this is also uh, quoted in the review by uh, Vitor uh, Cardoso and Pani, I should mention. And we've already seen this. I think there's some mess up with the slide, so apologies for that. Um, and that actually now moves us to the last part of my talk, which is modified theories of gravity. And here, the the goal um, that we or the question that we set out to answer was, well, if we assume that these semi-classical physical black holes exist, then what are the constraints that any self-consistent theory of modified gravity must satisfy to be compatible with their existence? And again, our only assumption here is that a regular apparent horizon forms in finite time of a distant observer. And somewhat surprisingly, so far, uh, only vacuum solutions for this problem are known explicitly in, in modified gravity. And I should also mention that we make no a priori assumptions about this modified gravity term. So we don't assume what, what causes these extra terms. This could be, I don't know, torsion gravity. It could be whatever you like, really. And um, we also work with the physical value of the horizon radius RG. So um, what does this mean? It means we work with the, the value that corresponds to this new perturbed metric. And um, this allows us to avoid artifactual divergences. Because if you get divergences, obviously we're only interested if they're actual real physical divergences. And because we don't make uh, any, any assumptions about this modified gravity term, the constraints that de de derive in this way will actually apply to all conceivable 
uh, modifications of general relativity, irrespective of any particular specific properties um, that our model might have. And because of this generality, this is actually a, a really powerful approach. Now I'm going to show you a quick qualitative overview of the results, but I think I'm, you can see that I'm almost been talking for an hour. So I'll try to uh, only focus on the main insights here. There are two things you can do. You can treat higher order terms, so terms that are greater than um, order of lambda are small. And if you do this, then you can expand in both the coordinate distance from the horizon and in lambda. And here uh, we just obtain constraints for the two classes of solutions. But then you could also consider the case where um, these high order terms are not small. And then of course, it doesn't make sense to also expand in lambda. So here you would only expand in terms of the uh, coordinate distance from the horizon. And here you obtain analogous constraints, but uh, you find that these solutions uh, have no well-defined GR limit. And this is what I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, so here you have higher order terms. And I should also say it suffices to consider lambda squared because higher order terms than that, um, if you really need them, you can just obtain them analogously. And um, if you uh, expand your, your energy momentum tensor components in this way, these are the metric functions that you will um, get back from the Einstein equations. Um, you obtain constraints that are uh, analogous to the perturbative K0 solution class. Um, but there is one very important difference, which is uh, that in this case, it's actually not possible to determine the sign of these two uh, Xi functions solely from the requirements of existence on consistency of the modified Einstein equations. And um, this is very important because in semi-classic gravity, the sign of these functions actually tells us that uh, the null energy condition has to be violated to have the horizon in, in finite time for distant observer. But here, because it's not possible to, to pin down the sign uh, just from existence and, and consistency of the Einstein equations, it's actually unclear uh, if you need to violate the NEC in those models uh, in order to form physical black holes with some kind of horizon. And now this slide shows the, the constraints that we derived uh, for um, so here we're in the the first case where we treat higher order terms as small, um, and I should have mentioned here we only considered K zero solutions because uh, those are the relevant ones, which is why I only have this slide. Um, but when we treat higher order terms as small, we considered both of them. And again, I I actually don't want to go into the details. The details are not so important. I only want to make uh, one comment, which is that these constraints manifest themselves in two different ways. So you can see the first way is that the modified gravity terms must follow these uh, particular expansion structures when you expand them in terms of X, so in terms of the coordinate distance from the horizon, where you have these half integer jumps. And let's say, for example, here, you have a term that's one over X squared, then there's a couple of things that can happen. Uh, this term has to be zero, otherwise it's not compatible. So either you get constraints by setting the coefficients equal to zero, or it's possible that it's not possible to make it zero. For example, if this is just RG prime over X squared, then you can't make it zero because if RG prime was zero, then you wouldn't have a dynamic black hole. Um, and in this case, you know that it's, it's incompatible with uh, semi-classical physical black holes. So this decomposition is one way that the constraints manifest themselves. Uh, the other way is that there are multiple relations between the coefficients of these uh, expansions that have to be satisfied. And we can actually look at those in a little more detail on the next few slides. So I should also mention this function chi um, is a function of time and It'll depend on your choice of time parameter, but it's somehow related to the evaporation rate uh, of the black hole. So in the K0 case, we have uh, two relations that relate the lowest order coefficients, and then one additional one that relates the next highest order coefficients. And um, for the K1 case, the situation is similar, but it's not quite the same. So here we only have one relation between the lowest order coefficients. And then there's one additional one, uh, which involves both lowest order and next highest order coefficients. And again, I'm because I think I'm already over time, so apologies for that. So I'll just quickly mention, um, we have checked if, if different theories satisfy those constraints. Um, and in particular, we found that any generic type of F of R theory, so for example, the Sharbinsky model, uh, identically satisfy all of the constraints. And in fact, even generic fourth order gravity theories so any theory that involves up to fourth order derivatives in the metric uh, identically satisfies all of these constraints. Now, there are other things that you uh, can look at that would be interesting to look at. 
And the first one is you could test additional modified uh, gravity models. For example, there have been some uh, recent reformulations of gauss bonnet gravity, which contain non-trivial gravitational dynamics, even in four space-time dimensions. Uh, so those would be interesting to test. But of course, it would also be interesting to generalize this procedure um, to higher dimensional black hole models and to non spherically symmetric space-times and to maybe include angular momentum as well. And I will end my talk here. I will leave you with this slide here, which is um, a short list of references that uh, came out from, from essentially Macquarie. So this is uh, Daniel Turner, uh, Pravin Dahal, Rob Mann, Valentina Bacchetti, and me. Um, and I've also uh, grouped them into different categories so you can sort of see what to expect in these different papers. So we have a couple on semi-classical gravity. Um, there's one which generalizes results to axial symmetry by Pravin and Danny, uh, modified gravity, and then the one in red is our big review, um, which you can find also on the archive. And we're, we usually uh, update new papers on, on the usual channels, so archive inspire research gate and Twitter. So I've included QR codes here if you're interested in following along. Um, so yeah, that, this is it. Thank you for um, being patient and listening to me for so long, and sorry for going over time a little bit. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you very much. That was a really uh, fascinating talk. Um, do we have any uh, questions from people? Uh, maybe I can start. Um, do you have any? Okay, well, maybe I. I think this is just a probably a, a short question, just about what you just talked about um, with the three modified gravities that you tested. Were there any that failed? Because it seemed like the three you tested. Um, um at your not so uh, so not in the case where we treat the higher order terms as small. So in that case, uh, we've tested f of r theories and and up to the generic fourth order theories, and none of them have failed so far. Um, I'm currently doing some calculations on on these uh, reformulated gauss bonnet gravity theories, and it looks like there is a chance that they might fail. Um, because they have some scalar terms in the action, and this looks a bit mm -hmm. suspect if you if you derive your field equation from that way and then check the constraints. But it's a bit too soon for me to um, to see if they fail. However, we've already seen that if you um, also consider these higher order terms as as not small or as as not non-trivial, um, then you already get uh, solutions that don't even have a well-defined GR limit. Um, so here it's already unclear even if if you need to violate the NEC to black hole solutions in these models or not. Uh, Archul? Yeah, can I ask, uh, maybe uh, after Victor. Victor, go ahead. Victor? You're muted if you're talking. Sorry, sorry, sorry it was muted. <laughs> it maybe not directly related, but at least in viewers, it looks similar. So we once we consider it, uh, um, purely classical metric, gravitational metric, which is close to black hole metric, but there is no event horizon, it's not a black hole yet. So uh, it's kind of metric which approaches black hole. And if, if you can see the scattering of a quantum particle rather than classical particle, cross-section is practically equal to cross-section of black hole. So there is no black hole, but cross-section is equal to, equal to cross-section of black hole. The point is that there is, very dense spectrum of resonance is formed, which very narrow resonances. Again, asymptotically, it will be zero, infinite density and zero, zero width of resonance. And if you calculate cross-section for any quantum particles, maybe photon, spinner, or scalar, cross-section will be, again, asymptotically close to cross-section of black hole. And because lifetime of the resonance uh, uh, tends to infinity, even Maybe external observer may, may never see this particle because it will stay spend a lot of time near black hole. So it looks like quantum effects, uh, quantum effects make black hole properties um, before actually black hole is formed. It may be black hole or just density singularity, but it's also similar properties. But for simplicity, I speak about metric which is close to black hole. So. What I, can, what I would like to say, but properties for scattering of quantum particle 
are principally different from scattering of classical particles. So I just repeat briefly. Uh, quantum effects create black hole properties before black hole is formed. So you actually don't need uh, black hole metric with event horizon. Am I clear or it's very confusing? Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And it actually, I mean, it, it goes very nicely with the results by VISA, who actually showed that you don't even need the horizon to have evaporating black holes. And it also, I mean, uh, it goes nicely with the, the paper by Holdem and Wren, um, because they've shown that, that you can mimic uh, these signatures with, with optics that are not actually black holes, but are really close to black holes. So I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised actually by, to hear what, what you're saying. Um, this sounds very reasonable to me. So if you're interested, my name is Flambaum and all papers are published about 10 years ago. For spinners, scholars, and photons, we calculated cross-section found with infinite, no, nearly infinitely dense spectrum of resonance, which have a very large lifetime. And again, it's imitation of black hole properties, but where is no event horizon. Uh, and uh, cross-section is still will be similar, well, practically the same as cross-section on a black hole. Yeah, Victor, cool. that, that what, sounds what, interesting. What, I'll have a look. Yeah, what, what, what properties are you talking about? The what cross-section? Uh, we're talking about the thermal radiation and the end of... Uh... It's, just, it's just elastic cross-section, but it looks like capture cross-section because uh, life, uh, time which particle spends near black hole in the resonance, this narrow spectrum of red, time tends to infinity. So it's formally, it's purely elastic cross-section. But it's equal to cross section of a uh, capture, capture cross section by a black hole. So it is UNRU solution, where a couple of people, UNRU and UNRU or and Smaradinsky, no, someone else, calculated cross section on black hole. And it, it's known for years. But after that, we found by the same cross section, you can get with no actually formed black hole. Again, due to very narrow resonances, where time delay is very big. So Asymptotically, it approaches to properties of black holes, so particles spend a lot of time there. Yeah, Am I clear or is still unclear? But formally, we calculate purely elastic cross section. But it behaves like inelastic cross section for capture on black hole. And uh, physically, because li lifetime of resonance tends to infinity, it will look like a capture. Okay. May I ask a question about uh, null energy con condition in this modified gravities? I mean, I'm a little bit surprised, uh, you know, with the general quadratic gravity, for example. Uh, of course, it's it's known that it carries a, a carries a degree of freedom which are with the negative energies, uh, right? Um, you know, in general case, not uh, R squared. Um, yeah, I think in that case, you would have to have a, a negative exponent here, right? Because that's what's used in, in some- No, 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 no. Well, uh, the, the third case. Um, this one here? The, the, yes, the, it carries ah, okay. a massive spin two, massive spin two with, with the negative energy. It's a ghost, uh, uh, you know, usual ghost, which makes it renormalizable. But nevertheless, yes. non-unitary. Yes, yes. So um, you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. In um, principle, yeah. The, those the, those theories theories are not stable if you if you you know uh, uh, cut it on on the quadratic level. You're you're absolutely correct. I'm glad you asked this because I had this problem um, when I wrote a paper, um, and it's true. In general, you you have ghosts, but there's a a very specific combination of these terms in the action that you can choose. Uh, which apparently does not have ghosts. So at least there are, are two papers by two separate uh, independent groups of researchers that argue that uh, you can avoid ghosts uh, if you have the right combination of these terms in the action. Um, I'd have to look up what it is specifically. I think there's some coefficients of four. No, well, uh, it's, it, it, the only combination I know is the gauss bonnet combination, which is topological. Then, um, uh, I, that that, no that might just freedom. be the one actually. Uh, um, yeah, I but can then actually, the, then, yeah, okay. Uh, let me see. I can actually check if I look uh, really quickly in this paper here, because um, I did write it. Actually, I can just look for ghost. Yeah, here. 
I even I even wrote in this paper typically plagued by ghosts. Um, but if you choose this particular form, yeah, but that's a Gauss-Bonnet combination. That's uh, no. It, it I mean yeah. The, 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 yeah, the that doesn't with, carry uh, any degree of freedom. So the problem yeah, is that people call different things Gauss-Bonnet gravity. So some okay. people call this Gauss-Bonnet. Yes, others no, but call that's it generic. A topological, that's a topological one, right? That's uh, you know. The, yes. You so this part here is a, is a topological yeah. invariant, and that's yeah, why yeah, it's well. Gauss-free. But yeah, this that, is a, that, a very that good point. That doesn't carry the local degree of freedom, though. Propagating. Yeah. 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 But no, yeah. you're absolutely no, right. It's, it's very a, interesting. A very good point. Very interesting. Okay, now how do I get back to sharing my <laughs> PowerPoint slide? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, it's good that you mentioned it because I, I totally forgot about it. And with the running a little late, I, I didn't even mention that. You know, you can you can uh, separate those degrees of freedom. At least in uh, quadratic gravity, it's, it's quite easy to do at least at classical level. Uh, you know, during the Legend transform, you can explicitly, you know, separate those degrees of freedom and make make the gravity, you know, of the first order in R, uh, but with these extra degrees of freedom floating. Uh, so you will see immediately that they carry the negative energies in general. Mm -hmm. case. Yeah, I I think I've read a paper by I think Kellogg Stelle that actually did that. Or something similar. At least. Well, the Gallup study is ex exactly obtained the in in that particular case the 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 gra uh, you know the gravitational you know the corrections the quantum corrections are finite, and the mm. reason for that is that the negative uh, energy modes cancel out in Feynman diagrams uh, the positive energy uh, contributions and, and in in essence. So this is this is the this is the way it goes. But if, in uh, in essence, this uh, this model is. Uh, is uh, you know it has a negative energy modes which which makes it not stable uh, in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, as you as you mentioned, this is just uh, you know the truncation of presumably more uh, uh, more full theory. And of course, there is this uh, ghost-free theories as well as you mentioned. But you need to intru introduce the high order terms uh, in, in, in there. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's definitely a lot to to still look at and do in with respect to this. Um, I'm a little worried that people are not super interested in it. So, because so far, um, at, at least in my experience, people seem to be more interested in those papers that are semi-classical than than those papers which are modified gravity. But it might just be a coincidence, or maybe it takes a bit longer to to pick up. You would yeah, well, I'm super interested in those things, and it was a very, very nice talk. Thanks. Okay, that's that's great to hear. I'm glad to hear that. That's uh, this gives. Do you look at biometric answer. gravity when you were looking at the different modifications of gravity? Sorry, could you repeat the, the first part? Sorry, did you look at biometric gravity, like a uh, massive biometric gravity? There's a nice like um, version for that too. No, not not specifically. Um, but actually. Is, is there a way to formulate biometric gravity in terms of these this extra emu new term? Because if it is, then there should be a way to um, directly compare the results if you can phrase it in, in terms of this lambda emu new term. No but idea. I don't work with biometric gravity, Maybe. so I'm not quite sure if, <laughs> if that's possible or if there's something standing in the way of, of doing that. Yeah, in biometric gravity, part of the diffeomorphism is usually violated. Uh, so you have two metrics, for example, uh, with yeah, okay. so then... variance, and then you are you know combining them together. So part of the diffeomorphism of this combined diffeomorphism is violated there. So it's just, uh, yeah. a different thing. But... So probably not directly comparable in that case, because if you have two metrics, um, then maybe not. Yes, but yeah. Um. I have a, another another question. It's um, it was about this the statement that you made about this uh, these um horizonless, ultra compact objects not requiring new physics to 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 form or or will be explained. What what is what is the basis of of that statement? Because it it seems to me naively at least these objects, if they did exist, would still be very very strange and, and exotic. Um, I, I would say, is it? It, it seems to be unclear that it that you would require, would require new physics to to have them or not. Um, are you talking um, at a strictly mathematical level from the context of gravity, or? 
and and not yeah i mean it, it's it's just uh there are horizon as you see all models that don't require you to violate the NEC simply because they don't have this horizon um i'm sure there are probably also horizon as you see all models that do require some strange stuff or strange new physics but it's not an absolute mathematical necessity on the other hand if you do believe in semi-classical gravity then violating the null energy condition is absolutely necessary. There's no way of, of going around that. Um, so just to, to go back to this nice paper by Oldham and Ren, for example, um, they, they looked at a horizons configuration. And like I mentioned in, in the talk, it, it matches the, the Schwarzschild solution so closely um, that here you would really need almost Planck scale precision to, to rule out that this is not a horizons object, but a true physical black hole with some sort of horizon. And okay, this is only Schwarzschild, but um, there's people that have generalized this to, to Schwarzschild care solutions as well. Um, so those including spin and, and some such. So, um, but yeah, of course, if we look back at um, this it classification was, scheme, I, yeah. But that paper, you know, by Bob Holdem, uh, isn't that uh, within the within the quadratic gravity? Those solutions, um, the cold solution. I, I don't think so. But even if it is, I, I know of others that are not formulated within quadratic gravity that are very similar. And of course, if we look at this graph here, uh, you can have very exotic. So if you have a, a physical black hole with some sort of horizon, then in this formula, you need epsilon to be zero. Uh, and then you're in this plane with um, black holes. So here you also see that there are mathematical black holes that can be physical black holes, um, but they're not overlapping. So there are also mathematical black holes that are not physical black holes. And there are also physical black holes that are not mathematical black holes. Um, and, and here with these Planck and, and clear photosphere objects, you can also have uh, very weird stuff occurring, but I'm, I'm not a, an expert in these um, objects. Uh, I just know that it's not a mathematical necessity to, to have new exotic physics, um, to have horizon as ultra compact objects, but it is a necessity if you want to enter this plane um, of physical and uh, mathematical black holes. And of course, this is also, I should have mentioned this, you might say, well, okay, we can look at regular black holes because regular black holes not necessarily have a singularity. And then maybe we can avoid some of the weird stuff that the true black holes would come with. But there are some problems with uh, um, the fact that most likely dynamic black holes of regular, black, uh, dynamic models of regular black holes are not, not stable. Um, so there are, are separate issues from that if you want to avoid the singularities. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah but I mean, those objects should um, be those objects then should be all primordial type of because there is no way to go, you know, to go. Ah, yes, that's matter. another great comment that I completely forgot. Yes, so if you have primordial black holes, that's a different beast. Um, then I mean, we don't even know where the horizon came from initially, so it could be anything. Um, so if it's primordial black holes, then uh, I think you can probably get around of, of violating the NEC. That, um, that may be slightly related to the kind of a general question that I wanted to ask, which is, um, would would the observation of of Hawking radiation in some form help kind of illuminate what these objects are, or illuminate something about the the, the nature of of gravity that you need to to describe them? Um, to be honest, I don't know for sure. I think my answer would be possibly because it depends on if you can extract any differences in this uh, Hawking radiation spectrum from having a horizon or not. Mm. Um, but I think it's it's at the moment, at least probably more promising uh, or more likely that these differences will exist uh, uh, in this relation between matter accreting and its luminosity um, that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, but I'm, I'm not the right person to ask you because I'm not doing observational astronomy. Um, but from people I talk to, uh, these seem to be the, the most promising candidates of distinguishing between horizonless objects and, and genuine black holes. Um, the other thing is with, uh, with Hawking radiation is that it's notoriously difficult to detect yeah. because for these supermassive objects, it's colder than the, um, the, the CMB background or the, um, so it's, yeah, it's very hard to detect. There's also some people that I think model it in the lab and then try to um, extract some info from, from the analogy between the mathematical description of these scenarios. Um, but yeah, so the, the short answer is, I, I don't know, possibly, I think for the moment, probably these ones are, are more promising ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that you can have Hawking radiation without having a horizon, um, as Matt Visser wrote in the paper. So 
uh, you really need, need to be able to pin down precise differences of what Hawking radiation would look like with a horizon, and how that would be different um, from Hawking radiation without a horizon. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, did we have any final questions from anyone who hasn't asked? Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, I, I had one, but I'm happy to do it after the break because I've had my turn. Um, all right, well, you know, we, I think we've uh, uh, maybe gone for, for long enough, so I'll stop the recording and we can.